आज को छलफल चाह प्लेन्स अफ डिस्कटेन्ट पोलिटिकल हिस्ट्री ऑफ नेपाल तराई सेवेन्टीन फोर्टी थ्री टू सेवेन्टीन टू ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी नाइन्टीनसम को किब प्रकाशन भाग यो किताब चाह मटिन चौतारी को लाइब्रेरी में रहकर रही किताब के बारे में आप छलफल चाहिए होने तीन भाषा में धीरे धीरे धन्यवाद यो कार्यक्रम कार्यक्रम यो किताब का सम यो किताब चाह मैक्स मिलन मौक लेख्त हो रहा वहाँ ने किताब को चालीस देखि पैंतालीस मिनट में प्रेजेंटेशन कर सेंसन में जो सर तो भाग पैले चौतारी को निमित छलफल के बारे में सामान जानकारी करना चाहूँ यो पंद्रह अगस्त दुई हजार तेईस में चाहे डेमोक्रेसी डायलग अंतर्गत डेमोक्रेसी रिसोर्स सेंटर ने मटिन चौतारी को संयुक्त आयोजना में संसदीय बहस में विधायक को पूर्व तैयारी अभ्यास के के होने विषय में चाहे होते में सुमना श्रेष्ठ प्रतिनिधि सभा सदस्य ठगेन्द्र प्रसाद पुरी राष्ट्रसभा पूर्व राष्ट्रसभा सदस्य और किरण दहाल संसदीय संसदीय मामला पत्रकार अनुसंधाता चाहे आर बोलते हुए पंद्रह अगस्त में तीन बजे रईस अगस्त में चाह बाईस अगस्त मंगलवार तीन बजे चाह हिमाली आदिवासी महिला को कथा र्यथा भीर्षक में चाह चाह कुजी बोलते हुए आईदी होगा थर्ड सेप्टेम्बर दुई हजार तेईस में चाह आईतवार को रिसर्च सेमिनार सीरीज अंतर्गत प्रोफेसर्स इनफर्मल लर्निंग इन देयर वर्क प्लेस द केस अफ नेपाल यूनिवर्सिटी भाई विषय में चाह छलफल होते इसको वक्ता चाह सबिना बानिया पोखरजी हो वहाँ से काठमंड यूनिवर्सिटी को असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर हो रहा यूनिवर्सिटी स्कूल अफ मैनेजमेंट में वहाँ आबद्ध हो पांच सेप्टेम्बर दुई हजार तेईस में चाह सामुपातिक समावेश सिद्धांत रचन परिणाम बीच को अंतर्विरोध को विषय में चाह छलफल होते रो जेबी विश्वकर्मा जी चाह बोलते हुए रो छलफल में आईदी हो यो तैयार को अगड़ी में लिफलेट भी रहे तैयार इस थप जानकारी दिन सब पाँच रौतारी को चरण अनुसार एक चरण चाह परिचय छोटो परिचय करें हम मचा बत्ता को बारे में कई छोटो परिचय दिखाँ तेस पच्चीस हम छलफल मत जा मेरा नाम चाहे सुहन शाह और मटी चौतारी में काम करते छोटो में मैक्स मिलन को बारे में मैक्स मिलन चाह त्रिभुवन यूनिवर्सिटी बड़ा मस्टर्स करूक प्राय नेपाली और विदेश जाने क्रम में वहाँ चाहे में आर मस्टर्स करूक तो अनौठो पाठ रमाइलो कुरो रहाँ को मस्टर्स चाहे त्रिभुवन यूनिवर्सिटीमें भारत दौरान चाहे वहाँ चाहे में चाहे एक्सटेन्सिवली चाहे भ्रमण करूक रहा को पेलो किताब चाहे बाई द वे अफ बोर्डर भाई प्रकाशन भाग रहे यह ट्रावल डायरी जो हो रो किताब भी मानी चौतारी को लाइब्रेरी में रहे कस अध्ययन करना चाहूँ भाई और वहाँ को दोसों किताब चाह द प्लेन अफ डिस्कटेन्ट चाहे जो हाल साल फैन प्रिंट बड़ा प्रकाशन भाग रहे और यही किताब के बारे में छलफल होने एंड अनफर्चुनेटली मैक्स डू नट स्पीक नेपाली बट ही अंडरस्टैंड लिटल बिट अफ नेपाली सो हिज प्रेजेंटेशन विल बी इन इंग्लिस एंड आफ्टर वर्ड द कन्वर्सेशन विल बी इन इंग्लिस बट यू आर तबी मधेशी भाषा मैथिली जो मुनेवारी जो भाषा में तब क्वेश्चन सोन मन लगे तो सोला क्वेश्चन एंसर सेंसन में बट हिज प्रेजेंटेशन विल बी इन इंग्लिश एंड आफ्टर वर्ड द क्वेश्चन एंसर सेंसन विल फलो सो मैच ओवर टू यू फोर्टी टू फोर्टी फाइव मिनट एंड आफ्टर वर्ड विल गो टू दिन थैंक यू फर कमिंग
and braving the rain on this particularly wet <laughs> Sunday afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be here, particularly at Martin Chowdhury. I've been reading your work, particularly the uh, studies in the Pali History and Society Journal for over a decade, so it's a real privilege um, to be here. So I'll be talking today about my book, as uh, Soha mentioned, uh, Plains of Discontent, A Political History of Nepal's Sarai. Um, a little bit about me, obviously uh, Sohan has mentioned some of this before, but I'm a researcher, I focus on political dissent, migration, humanitarian assistance, political identity and citizenship, particularly in Asian borderlands. Um, I've written for a number of international publications and a, a number of Nepali publications as well. Um, yeah, so you can see some of the information here. But really today I'm talking about the book, and so this photo was taken on September 2015, just after the promulgation of the Constitution. The same day, this photo was taken in the Tehran. So that really, the juxtaposition between celebration in one part of the country and deadly protests in the other got me really interested in uh, political developments in the Tehran, constitutional developments, and the political history. Um, so really what this book is, it's an attempt to show how major political schisms, cleavages, and social issues in the Tehran boiled over into the deadly protest in 2015. It is also the story of Nepal told through the eyes of the Tehran. So by telling the story of the Tehran's political development, we gain a, new, a unique viewpoint to see Nepal's history. It's a story that takes us from the conquest and unification drive of Prithvi Narayan Shah, to the experiences with colonialism under both the East India Company and the later British Raj, the codifying of Nepal's fixed boundaries, the legacies of which continue to disrupt Indo-Nepal relations to this day, <coughs> as we just saw three years ago with the Lipolek um, dispute, the development of Nepal and its border infrastructure, due to land allocation, land reform, the development of national parks, and the impact of malaria eradication, and the impact of those two factors on indigenous communities in the Tarai, migration, linguistic policies, citizenship, constitutional debates, the rule of law, all the way to federalism, while asking fundamental questions about Nepal as a nation state and what it means to be Nepali. To give just one example of this, take the impact of the Shah conquests on land reform and migration in the Tarai. Under Privy Narayan Shah, control of the Tarai provided huge economic gains, which had become increasingly important. The wealth of the Tarai was necessary to fund a growing and burgeoning military as the Gorkha Empire grew and expanded. The Tarai, yes, it had wealth in timber and natural resources, but it also had huge wealth and importance in land grants. These land grants were given as a form of payment to victorious officers. It was a handy way of paying staff, and it left the coins of the Gurkha Empire undisturbed and helped extend the Gorkha influence into new lands without cost to Kathmandu. The use of land grants was fundamental to the survival and the growth of the Gorkha Empire. From soldiers, generals, and nobles of the Gorkha elite, all were granted land following successful military campaigns. These land grants were heavily concentrated in the Tehran. And it was important that the recipients of these land grants were able to put them to good use, given that the tax revenue derived from the grants was vital for the kingdom's treasury. Now, as the amount of taxation that had to be paid on this land stayed constant, whether the land was worked, but left, was worked or left barren, it made sense to encourage settlers to work the land to derive maximum revenue from it. The more money they generated from the land, the less the relative taxation of that revenue decreased. So this created a demand for labor in the Tarai, and landlords looked to nearby India to fill the labor gap, and indeed agents in Nepal and northern India were really busy, highly busy, attracting laborers to move to Nepal. And it's really, we see a kind of push-pull factor during this time, as to why there was a pull factor to the Tarai in terms of there was available uh, labor there. But also at the same time, conditions in northern India were particularly difficult driving many to look further afield to secure their livelihood. Many, this is a, a period when indentured labor became huge throughout India, but also at this time in northern India, particularly Bihar, there was a famine in Purnia district, a drought which extended almost across the entire northern Bihar in 1791, in 1783, sorry, and then in 1791, there was a rice crop failure. Also, so as a result, 
So this drove migration into the Terai from northern India. As a result, the population of the Terai began to increase and the region began to change slowly but steadily. Deforestation also began to increase at this time and families began to arrive to till the soil and plough fields. It is really vital to recognize here though that the entire Medeshi population did not arrive now. In fact, thousands, maybe many more, lived in Nepal for generations before the Nepali state encroached and expanded onto where they were living. However, thousands did arrive in this period under invitation of the government and local landowners. So therefore we see, just from one aspect, how the conquest of Prithvi Narayan Shah and the subsequent land reform development and migration change the social, demographic, economic, and agricultural fabric of the Tarai. On a slightly different note, we can also, when we have a, a much wider history, we can start to examine events that we wouldn't traditionally associate with the political development of Nepal. One, one of those exact examples is in 1857, in what is commonly known as the Indian Mutiny, but increasingly becoming known as the First War of Indian Independence. So after the outbreak of the mutiny, John Bahadur Rana was quick to offer extensive support to the East India Company. In, in fact, he not only led attacks on mutineers in Lucknow, but he soon promulgated legislation which denied the sanctuary for fleeing mutineers to find refuge in Nepal. As a result of this, in, in 1858, he was given his reward. Not only was he given the Nyamola, huge swathe of the Western Sarai, but also now he was had a solid friendship with the British. This meant for the first time since the unification of Nepal, they no longer needed to fear an invasion from the south. So therefore, for the first time, the, for all of this period, the Terai had been kept as a malarial swamp. This is really a vitally geostrategic tool. In fact, in 1814 to 1816, during the Anglo-Nepal War, some battalions of the East India Company suffered more losses from malaria than they did of fighting. So the malarial, the, uh, malarial barrier that Terai offered was no longer needed for the first time. And this was important because now the British Raj, after the mutiny, were sitting in Calcutta, Delhi, all over northern India, and they were terrified of another uprising. So they began to prepare to make sure this couldn't happen again, or if it did, they'd be better prepared. One way they did this was through the mass extension of railways. Railways are important because you can ship battalions and troops across the country far faster than you can by land or uh, by walking. Um, so before the mutiny in 1854, there were just 34 miles of railway which existed throughout the entirety of India. 34 miles. Yet by 1881, this number had grown to 9,800 miles of railway. 20 years after that, by 1901, 25,000 miles of railway was now laid in India which requires huge amounts of timber, much of which came from the Tarai. So therefore, we see the, the culmination of a few things with the 1857 mutiny and afterwards. We see the return of Naya Moloch. So I shoot again, so after 1816, Nepal had seceded this in the Sagawi Treaty. So we saw the first, we saw the um, re-expansion of the Nepali state. Then we saw the transformation of the Indian Nepal border from a malarial barrier for the first time to a marketplace. And we, we also saw huge amounts of money flood into Kathmandu following the sale of the Tarai's timber, which many in the Raj declared to be some of the highest quality in the world. So that's just one interesting anecdote. Um, but really, the story of the Tarai is the story of one of Nepal's most important regions important economically, geopolitically, linguistically, and culturally. The Terai is crucial to Nepal's past, present, and future, and is a story of immense importance to Nepal and the rest of South Asia. It's important to note, uh, within the book I talk about a lot of policy and political clashes. These are not by no means unique to Nepal. Indeed, the issues and themes that characterize these disputes are similar to those around the region and the world. And in fact, they're not as severe as some of these disputes or political conflicts in the rest of the region. For example, the Rohingya genocide, the ongoing Kashmir conflict, the Sri Lankan civil war, and the recent conflict in Manipur. Therefore, I firmly believe that some of these issues in the Terai can be solved through proper government and public policy. 
And within the book, you'll see I highlight areas of real reform and progress. And it's also important to point out, uh, particularly as I'm not Napoleon, I'm, I'm British, uh, that this book is not an attack on Nepal, far from it. I've been critical of some policy decisions in the past because I firmly believe that seeking an inclusive Nepal is vastly important, not just for social harmony, but for Nepal's economy, education, infrastructure, and future, because no country can grow sustainably with long-term social fractures. And when reading, you'll also see I'm critical of some Medeshi political parties for their failure to capitalize on their power and bring meaningful change. So therefore, this book is not a black or white or binary analysis, simply blaming elites in Kathmandu for everything that's gone wrong. Rather, I have attempted to provide a nuanced understanding of these current disputes, framing them not as good versus evil, but highlighting the key points and successes and failures of both sides. Indeed, my intent is not to point at individuals or a specific group, but rather forces of history that shape Nepal at certain critical junctions. Nor do I see this as a conflict between hill people and Medeshis, not at all. Rather, it's the struggle between the minority and the majority government, a struggle that, that it repeats itself daily across the world. Here, I think it's important to point out the book ended in 2019. Um, at some level, any book has to end at some point, otherwise you'll just keep writing and writing. Um, but really, I, the reason I chose 2019 to end the book was for two reasons. Initially, I thought I would end the book around in 2015, um, after the promulgation of the Constitution, but I decided for two reasons to go for 2019. One, I wanted to show some of the malaise and stagnation that took place after, between 2015 and 2019, um, but secondly, I also, wanted, I also felt that the closure of the Alliance for Independent Madesh and CK's route transition was an important event to close on. The AIM was a thorn in the side of those who thought the Madeshi movement had burnt out or could be ignored. So when CK route signed an agreement with KPO Lee to stop secession activities and start working with the government rather than against it, I felt this was an important moment that had to be featured. So this does mean the book hasn't covered recent political developments since 2019. I think one of the most crucial recent ones is the citizenship exclusion and um, the recent citizenship amendment bill. So these amendments are crucially important at the individual level for those who now have access to citizenship. It's a major celebration as it should be. Citizenship is fundamental to being a member and playing an active part in any nation state. Yet at the macro level, the, this amendment should be a reminder of the decades of discriminatory policy that went out of its way to exclude Medeshis from their legal status of Nepali. We can celebrate the individual joy that a person has when they receive citizenship, but let us not forget the hurt endured, the culpability of the government, and we should continue to dwell and have a somber reflection on how many lives were placed on hold and left with restricted horizons. How many people for decades were denied their right to vote, social security, or access to education. So today I'll give an overview of some brief themes uh, covered in the book. One of the hardest parts of writing any book is not what you put in the book, it's due to space limitations, what you don't put in the book. Um, and that's even more pronounced today when I just have 45 minutes. So while I'll touch on some topics by nature, they will be quite brief. I don't have the time, unfortunately. Um, yeah. So really, when I set out to, uh, set out to write this book, I wanted to answer a few key questions. So how does the Terai, or how is it shaped Nepal's past, present, and future? And the opening uh, section of the book, I open with an uh, overview of the Tikapur massacre and the subsequent repression on Tarus and Kailali province that followed. I wanted to see how Nepal got to this point, how the hundreds of years of political developments in the Terai and the rest of the country shaped events that culminated in these protests. I also want to point out why political, economic, or social analysis of the Terai has to be grounded in a rigorous understanding of the historical grievances many in the Terai have. Politics does not take place in a vacuum. If we're designing policy or analysis, we need to understand all of the themes that surround it. And also, why policy or analysis treating the Terai as a monolithic block is doomed to fail. There's far too many nuances. Um, going on a play here to just talk in black and white. I think you can put the lines up.
And there was a couple of points or aims which the book aims to do. First was to bridge the gap between scholarship and the general readership. Issues in the um, in the Tarayan Madesh are very well known within academic uh, within within academia. There's a huge number of journals, of reports, and chapters that detail these issues. But what I found is outside of the sometimes narrow confines of academia, these issues weren't very known. And this particularly came in in some of the interna particularly international media coverage, but also domestic media coverage in 2015 and in 2016 during the border blockade. So what I wanted to do was not to provide a blow-by-blow -blow account of everything that happened from 27, 2007 to 2015, but what I wanted to do was to write up an easy access, readable introduction to the major themes and events that shaped the Torah's history and really provide a launching pad for someone to read the book and then they can get engaged in some of the fantastic literature um, that is out there. And also to explain how we have the history of the relationship with people in the Torah with the, with the Nepali state continues to affect the policy and politics to this day. Um, and of course showing how if we use the Torah as a lens to view Nepal's history, we get a different approach than we do if we take it purely from a state-centric point of view. Um, so these are some of the major themes um, that the book covers. As I mentioned, I can't, I don't have the time to go into detail with them, uh, but I can talk about them briefly. So first of all, I talk about the role of the Shire expansion on the Terai, how the Terai was unified and became part of modern-day Nepal. Talk about land distribution, as I spoke about a little bit earlier. But also, I wanted to highlight how internal and external migration to the Terai started at the very start. Often when we think about internal migration or demographic changes in the Terai, our starting point is not 1960, post-EDT, post-malarial eradication, when actually it starts way before that. Um, and again, the role of malaria in the Terai during the Anglo Nepal War, as I touched on before. Following that, I jump onto the Ranas and their relationship with the Terai, which is rather different. While the, Gog, with the, the Shah um, regime was expanding, the Ranas, uh, particularly after 1816, had, were constricted, so rather than looking at new territory, they turned their gaze internally and onto the, onto the Terai. So we saw, again I mentioned 1857, uh, but it talked a lot about the development of Nyamullah, the expansion of the state presence into places where there was previously little government presence or state presence. Um, and what's really interesting is you can go back through some of the uh, literature and archives and see that the Ranas were, again, my point about internal and external migration, we spent a huge amount of time trying to attract ethnic Nepalis from uh, around South Asia to return. They gave them very generous terms. So uh, flies and announcements in Gorkha Patra were basically announcing to Nepalis in Bhutan, Assam, Burma, Sikkim, asking them to come back uh, to work in the Terai. They would give, in some cases, uh, free land, tax-free for 10 years. And while this uh, the return of the diaspora Nepalis didn't really kick off, they continued to the point where they were even offering land to convicted murderers. So I think that's, that's a really interesting point of the history, and that's all detailed in the book. And then moving on to Panchai, there are several really important parts here. So the malaria eradication and resettlement is well detailed, but also at the same time as within the Terai, you have um, huge amounts of internal migration to the Terai. This was the same time where under King Mahendra, a new form of cultural nationalism was being promulgated, which explicitly excluded Madeshis and Tarus from that identity. Um, and just to touch one point quickly on uh, the malarial eradication, this really saw the Terai for the first time being pacified uh, with the eradication and the removal of the mosquito threat. But this meant, particularly for the Tarus, they would soon be minorities in their own homes. So the eradication of malaria was not wrong, far from it. It was a major public health issue. In fact, it was a public health nightmare that was wreaking havoc and destroying lives across the country. But the problem here is the eradication project was designed in a bubble. There was no dialogue with Taru or indigenous communities in the Tarai and it was conducted without consideration to how this would impact on their lives. The long-term implications were either ignored or not considered, and it would have a dire ramification for such groups. Neither USAID or US OM at the time, the United States Mission um, 
or the state took a holistic approach to the problem, guided as they were by the myopic understanding that a chemical attack on malaria was all that was needed and there was no need for a wider consideration of the implications and externalities that a program would introduce. And then I talk also about national parks where we saw the gurus <coughs> in a double whammy. First, they've been forced out of their land and then the national parks, they were kicked out of their forests, relocated in the name of sustainability. And yet, we, the evidence shows for hundreds of years, Tarus were living in a sustainable manner with the forest. In fact, it was the state that was appropriating the resources of the Tarus forests. And then I think the really galling point here is to mention so that Tarus were no longer allowed to stay overnight in the national parks. Why? Because that's, because that's environmentally dangerous. And yet at the same time, if you had enough money, you could stay in a luxury lodge in the national park. I thought that's really it's, um, an important point to, uh, to unpack. And then post-1990, um, I talk about, again, about the 10-year uh, uh, People's War, the impact on the Terai, the dynamics between Maoists, Medeshis, and Tarus. Of course, I talk about the first and second Medeshi Anderlands, and then disputes between Medeshis and Tarus, which kind of took place around 2008, 2009. Um, and then moving on to the precursor to 2015, I do a deep dive on the Nepal's constitution since 1950, uh, and the, a number of citizenship bills kind of giving a primer to the protests that would take place in 2015, so we can understand protests of 2015, the Third Andalan, the border blockade, and of course, the Tikapur massacre. Um, and following on from that, in the final two chapters, I talk about some of the major issues that uh, dominate and contextualize uh, the political life in the Tarai today, the, perhaps one of the most important one is human rights violations. Evidence shows that human rights violations and uh, state abuses occur overwhelmingly in higher numbers in the Terai. Not just do they occur in a much higher numbers in the Terai, state impunity is much higher in the Terai. And there's also been, we can say, a failure of the media or of uh, wider civil society to advocate for the need to bring um, state abusers to justice. There's, a lot, there's also quite a lot of discussion about the open border and the benefits around that or the uh, challenges sometimes that, um, that it brings. And I talk about the role of transported communities as well. And then finally, finishing up with a uh, discussion on federalism and of course then CK Route and the AIM. So, another major point of the book is focusing on the Nepal-India border and how it was drawn. And the myriad of border skirmishes and disputes that occurred both prior and after the Anglo-Nepal War and Sugawi Treaty. So the book talks about the colonial systems of mapping and control, which were popularized by the East India Company, and how that compared to the spheres of influence that was common under the uh, Shahs, and how these clashes ended up in war. Really, by studying the manner and circumstances in which these borders were formed, we gain a better insight into Nepal's modern-day borders and their limitations. If we understand the flawed processes of border creation, if we understand how colonial officers in the East India Company would stay in Patna because they were too scared to come to the Terai to map out borders because they were worried they'd, be, um, they'd suffer from malaria, we understand that these borders are hastily arranged, are poorly marked, or they are demarcated along rivers, which every monsoon can change their course. So this allows us to take a more considered approach to territorial disputes. And indeed, as I mentioned, a few years after finishing the research for this book in, 2000 and, uh, in 2020, I finished the research for the book, just a few weeks later, we saw how important having a detailed and nuanced understanding of border formations are with the eruption of the Lipolek dispute. Um, and I think there's also the very real potential due to how these borders were drawn, uh, incredibly inaccurately, often on unreliable maps, um, that there could well be future border disputes again in the future, um, but these disputes need to be treated rationally with an understanding of the history rather than just nationalist rhetoric on both sides. Another point is to talk about the open border, um, and I believe we, we need to see the open border as a massive opportunity for growth, rather than merely a security threat that has to be addressed. <coughs> so often the open border is seen through a macro security lens, with a heavy focus on security implications. 
That's, of course, highly important. In fact, it's necessary. Every state should be looking at uh, security and border security. However, such security and border policy needs to be contextualized and also seen through a macro level with a focus on the individual. A human-centric approach to border security is therefore needed, not instead of a security approach, but complementary to it. For example, Nepal often closes the land borders for elections. We saw this most recently in April this year with the Barra uh, district by-election, and in November last year uh, for the general election where the land border was closed for 72 hours. This is done under a suspicion of voter fraud uh, or electoral man uh, manipulation from India. Now, in all of my research, and if anyone here has any evidence contrary, please let me know, I'd be delighted to hear it, but I've yet to see any statistically significant evidence of voter fraud coming over from over the border, yet the border is still closed. And it's really important to note that these closures have, while they have a minimal impact on reducing voter fraud, they have a huge impact on the lives of individuals in the terrain. This stops people from transporting communities, from accessing schools, healthcare, or work. So this is poor policy that's resulted from a lack of understanding of border regions and the needs of local transborder populations. Moreover, flights between Nepal and India were not cancelled. The border was open as long as you could afford a plane ticket. Unfortunately, many in the Terai in these cross-border communities who were most affected, most negatively affected by these 72-hour border closures could not afford these flight tickets. So there are other reasons as well why studying the Terai and the open border is important, particularly for the rest of South Asia. The open border stands as a tonic compared to the highly militarized borders elsewhere in the region. Look at India's other borders, maybe apart from Bhutan, but that's a special case. They're all dominated by state security forces with restrictions on movement. They have massive implications on trans-border communities. If you look at the India-Bangladesh border, of course, the India-Pakistan border, we see human rights violations occurring at an incredible rate. We see the agency and the activism of local people have to do to live their daily lives. We see the issues of enclaves. Um, this doesn't really happen on the Nepal-India border because it's an open border. So therefore, the Nepal-India border is notably and admirably different from the rest of the region. And this should be celebrated, but also it deserves further academic attention. Um, so the border, I, I believe it's immensely important to understand the political developments of the Terai, as is the relationship between the, between the Terai and Kathmandu. Some of the biggest policy challenges Nepal has faced and will be likely to face will be in the Terai. And that's why understanding the politics and the political history and the historical grievances that many in the Terai have with, the Kathmandu, with Kathmandu and the Nepali state is so important. It's important for two reasons. One, so we know how we got here, and so we can understand the fractured history of Nepal. And two, that policymakers and politicians can craft public policy that works for all and help create a united Nepal. Major policy cannot and will not be successful unless it's grounded in an understanding of political and historical grievances and takes these into account. If it doesn't, it's policy that's rooted in information failure and will be doomed to be unsuccessful. I'm going to come on to the conclusion now. Um, so since the end of Pinchayat and the eventual return to democracy, so much has changed in Nepal over the last few decades. The scale of political change in Nepal is at times staggering. Since 2006, there have been multiple successful elections, the disarmament of the Maoists, three Madeshi movements, Taru movements, the introduction of federalism, the abolishment of the monarchy, a return to secularism, ethnic minorities now enjoy a more representative democracy. In a federal Nepal, Madeshis are the majority in one province, a province named after them. Their political demands are well known and they consider Singh Durba as elected mainstream politicians. Their children can learn their mother tongue in school, they can wear a dhoti or a kota instead of a dara surawal and no longer have to wear a dhaka topi just to enter a government office. Madeshis have repeatedly, and Tarus, have repeatedly exercised their political will and their collective movement almost brought the country to its knees. Nepal, founded and unified as a Hindu kingdom, is now a secular, democratic, federal republic whose first president and vice president were Madeshis. The mayor of Kathmandu, of course, is also a Madeshi. This was unthinkable just a few decades ago, let alone when Prithvi Narayan Shah expanded his kingdom down to the Terai. However, while so much has changed, so much has stayed the same. 
Many Tarus are still barred from their ancestral homes while the government makes money from national parks. The Madeshi Andalans, while bringing unprecedented masses out to the street, have still not turned Nepal into a truly equitable state. Federalism, while bringing some benefit and autonomy to regional governments, has fallen short of the wider state restructuring many had hoped for. Some of the key issues that brought millions out onto the streets remain unsolved. There remains a residual anger in the Terai, and no one knows how many, how many of their grievances will be addressed or if they will at all. There are a litany of human rights violations that civilians in the Terai routinely face. One of the most serious and troubling of these are extrajudicial extra killings and a pervasive feeling of impunity among the security forces operating in the Terai. So therefore, while Nepal has come so far, it has so far still to go. We cannot and we should not mistake an absence of protest as an affirmation of long-term stability or content with the status quo. The continued existence of social issues and cleavages in the Terai rankle, given, given the otherwise mass political change that has taken place. However, the immense change Nepal has, under, has undergone in the last few decades can offer positivity. It shows Nepal has the capacity and ability to bring about and navigate huge structural, political, and social change, changes that would have seemed unimaginable just a few decades ago. So there is far to go, but an acknowledgement of how much distance has already been traveled <coughs> is a positive reminder. So therefore, when we look back at the hundreds of years of the history of the tribe, what do we see? It, it's not just the confluence of the politics of identity, ethnicity, and oppression. It's much more than that. It's the study of land reform, feudalism, linguistic politics, borders and their implications, resource theft. These are all highly nuanced issues. It's knowing how political elites can invite migrants to settle and exploit their labor one minute and then cast them out as unwelcome outsiders the next as soon as it becomes politically expedient. It's an understanding of migration, of national and collective identity, internal migration, and the idea of the other. It is understanding the lack of knowledge majority groups have around minorities and the dynamics and impressions within minority groups themselves. It is understanding the history of the Terai's relationship with Kathmandu casts long shadows that continue to affect policy and politics today. Perhaps more than that, it is understanding that the situation in the Terai is so complex, it defies easy explanations and binary answers. The nuance is too deep for that. However, if we make efforts to truly understand the growth, the infighting, the successes and failures of Medeshi and Taru movements, we go a long way to understanding modern day Nepal and its planes of discontent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Max. And, uh, and uh, now we will just go to the Q&A session. So three questions at a time. Uh, if there are questions, please. Nepalima, Maitlima, Madesi Basama, Hindi Ma, and Jati Mobutsu, right? Um Angredi Ma Pani Vana Pines question. I mean Mother Gate answer to me too. So thanks for your presentation. Uh, first I have a question regarding how the book was uh, printed and mm -hmm. editorially processed. Yes. I've actually read the book. Okay. Um, as an editor, I got I got very disappointed when you see an end note and a footnote mm -hmm. sticking at the end of the same sentence. Mm -hmm. That to me indicates that either you or the publisher at the end of the book pre-press work kind of hurried through the production process. Yeah. Let, let me finish. Okay. Uh, I've now been editing Sidas for 27 years, and so I know enough about the pre-press work. That if you put in just three more days of work in the pre-press production, you can easily get rid of that kind of a glitch. Okay. So whose decision was it to go with both footnotes and endnotes after having, one can easily say, having chosen the endnote route initially? So that's. I have other questions, but I'll ask them okay. after you've answered them. Well, I mean, so, first of all, the ed editing process took eighteen months. Uh, working uh, pretty extensively with fine prints and external editors. Uh, the decision to include endnotes and footnotes was, um, endnotes are really for the citations, but the footnotes, there's only a couple, 
in the book and therefore information that I thought was pertinent to the reader. Uh, you may disagree with the stylistic choice, but it's the choice we went for, and I think we can uh, uh, justify it. Yeah. So the, the, the second half of that question is, I don't know if you've noticed, but many of the end notes actually are incorrect. Increasingly, for instance, if you look at, uh, common, you, you have a sentence saying that clearly refers to Kamal Prakash Maldav's famous article about Baum Bar in Himal. You turn into the end load, and then you have somebody else being cited there. So I've actually mentioned this to Swan as well, because he, I knew that he, would, he was going okay. to be talking. So you need to go back and do that. So if the book is ever going to be reprinted, okay. I think it should be done by making those, by correcting those errors, which are, you know, from my point of view, very technical errors, right? Okay. So, so, so that's part one. Um, you began by saying today's presentation that you've been a fan of reading Sinas for the last 10 years. Yes. So <coughs> reading through your book, I was really surprised by the fact that um, mm -hmm. some of the real good articles we've published over the last 25, 27 years on the Parai is actually not even cited once and some of the insights that came out from those articles are not, not in your book. Now, as you mentioned, in this kind of an introduction book, you cannot actually include everything, right? So you, you make certain decisions as the author. But I would have thought that uh, some of the writings of Bhaskar Gautam around the issue of citizenship, or Arjun Gurentre's article that appeared in the very first issue of Sinas in 1996 on why in the early parts of the 20th century, although there was enough lands to be had, Farus in Chiton actually chose not to get them. And, 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 and then I can mention more recent articles by people who work here uh, very recently, Sujit Kern and colleagues on the 2017 local elections and how local elections both represented questions related to identity politics as well as electoral politics and so forth. So there are, and also Christine Kain's article on the, on the armed groups. So you made clear decisions not to use those. So I was wondering why. Um, yeah, thank you. I think it's an introductory volume. As, as you mentioned, there's only so much you can uh, you can talk about. Um, mm, yeah, I think um, I'm just trying to provide a one volume overview as opposed to a comprehensive academic study. I can't cite say everything due to um, space, space limitations. So that would be that would be why. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I, I partly only read the book, but I'll I, I put my point in Nepal, I think, for my convenience. I you have a little bit of 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 a जुन structural changes in Nepal to government and doctrine, like language policy, citizenship policy, land reform policy, resettlement plan. So we could have mentioned government. So, in period, the electoral system like Jun Kishin adopted. To minimize the representation of Madhesi community in Panchayat period. Uh, I never, I, I didn't uh, uh, get uh, in your this presentation and in the last presentation of the BJD office. So, have you mentioned in your book or just uh, you ignore it, the syst electoral system or representation policy of the Panchayat period? Number one question. Is it important or not? Why you, know, you, you, you are not mentioned here or just in the second point uh, in chapter six, just looking at the content, uh, in chapter six you have mentioned here uh, the CK route and the alliance of independent Pradesh. You know? uh, I, I, I want to I want to hear in this uh, part why you have mentioned only CK route. Uh, due, due to his degree or due to his uh, <coughs> agenda, 
Mm-hmm. It is personality or it is agenda. If agenda is important, then before Sikh era, there was Jai Krishna Goy who introduced the separatist movement in, I think, early 2000, 2003 or 2000. And not only Jai Krishna Rao Goy, but before that, <coughs> 1950, 60, I think, uh, uh, Raghunath Thakur uh, first time introduced the Madhesh should be separate or independent mm-hmm. from the Nepal. So I think the separatist movement in Madheshi politics has started in 1960, but we have not yet yeah. So this could be sure. Um, we'll take one more question. Okay. And then sure. we'll the Orkavan Kuni Prasna Savan. So we will. Uh, oh. uh, just to be your. Uh, 2019, some sort of inner acting group with the two and cut it back on. Three questions I have to you. Um, if you understood, the uh, uh, first is uh, about. After 1950, electoral system that the uh, state has adopted yeah. and the uh, subjugation of the Madhesis and marginalization of the Madhesis thereafter. That was the first question. Mm-hmm. The second question is about why did you choose uh, CK Rao? And very sarcastically, he also said because of his Cambridge degree or because of his uh, agenda. Yeah. Uh, so that was the sarcasm uh, of <laughs> in the question too. And the third question is by Krishnaji about, uh, I mean, you, although you said that uh, 2019 is the cutoff, but he still he wants to get more clarification on why 2019 as such is the cut And uh, and I, I, one more question is that before Sikharao, there was many other movements like Lobna Thakur, also some Bhavna Party, Jai Krishna Goit and all these things. Why these characters were yeah. were uh, not uh, represented in the book, yeah. but the Cambridge degree is represented in the book. Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was his sarcasm. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I do talk about in the book about the kind of panchayat um, period and kind of political developments in there. But again, due to space limitations, I can't get into every single point. Um, so it's kind of a general overview. Uh, so that's why it, it touches on some of the uh, political exclusion um, and kind of unitary rule in, in the panchayat period. Uh, but there's not a lot of space to kind of talk about individual things. Um, to come on to why CK route, and it actually touches into why 2019. Um, this is a it's a narrative uh, book, it's not an academic book. I was trying to find a uh, end point. As I mentioned, I didn't want to end on 2015. I thought that would be a little bit disingenuous. I wanted to kind of show how after these movements, um, after people went back to their homes, went off the streets, these issues continue to um, continue to exist. Um, so I wanted to kind of have a point a few years on after uh, 2015, and I thought CK route um, movement or the ending of the AIM was important. Um, it's I just I found him a very interesting character, um, someone who it's not about his academic credentials, but someone who gave up quite a privileged life uh, to become a repeated political prisoner. Um, I thought that was interesting, but as, as I mentioned, I was trying to find a. Um, a useful kind of a natural finishing point uh, to it. Uh, again, the book, as, as I mentioned in the presentation, this is not a blow by blow account. It's not a textbook. Um, you know, for example, like Kalpana Jar's um, Madeshi Uprising and Contested Idea or did or I Contested Idea in the Force of Fantastic Book. This is not, this is kind of like a stepping stone to that as a narrative, one volume introduction for people who may know nothing about the Tarai, who want to understand the key themes, and it's ideally. It's uh, an introduction to ground them in the understanding and then they can go away. So yeah, I, I understand that I hear your, all your concerns. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned, due to space and time considerations, we can only do a kind of brief cursory introduction or explanation of some points. Okay, uh, yes, please. Uh, Modest Vitravani, our Yale Pillar got a fully Modesco Gordon Way, a Possum Modesco Gordon Way to Malay Havana. But a fully Modesco Possum Modest Novani, a little don the decay to her. Kiva Costa de Kesa, a neck of a ambulance, a full bit of Possum Duty, Pirago Modest Legati, or a lap of Tony Velaki, or a negative modest for this advertising of material lap of Tony for you. Just a currently got a little Possum Modesma, or a Epergato don the Sizana Bagosa. 
well-meaning or at least you know they appear to be well-meaning due to uh, uh, the national park for eradication but the increased system between the privilege of the marginalized sort of so my question is slightly after 2019 but i'm sure you uh, kept up a little bit i was wondering like in that light if you see similar threats uh the disparities between you know the privilege and the marginalized in the recent hot discussions about uh building of the airport in the fall uh, Okay, one more question. Uh, what is it? Two for two. So the Banyas Banyas questions was you yeah, that there is a stark difference uh, in East and West. East means the yeah. the we often joke it as Sarkari Madhesh Pradesh that is the eighth district, and uh, another is the West uh, from Nagar Parasi all the way to Kanchenpur in Kailadi. And then he makes a point that uh, because the uh, when, when the movement is together from east to west, uh, benefit somehow goes to the eastern Madhesis, uh, the, the Sarkari Madhesi Pradesh, uh, the Goran, uh, the eight district Madhesi Pradesh, and but then west is somehow ignored in that uh, dynamic, and because of that there is a brewing uh, tensions, and the new political parties are formed in the west Madhes, western Madhes, like uh, like. Uh, uh, like uh, Tripathi and other was the forming the so and then he is making the argument that that in the Tarai region the Western Madhes are um, is more and more marginalized as compared to the Eastern Madhes. So so how do you uh, how do you address that uh, in your book because mm -hmm. because you have an entire uh, from east to west yeah. from Tharus to Madhesi. So so probably probably his question would be the west means Tharus and uh, mostly Tharus and Madhesis vis-a-vis -vis the east uh, of the Madhesis and Tharus and the yeah. kinds of the political dynamic and the, and the second question on this guy you understood yeah, yeah sure um yeah so I, I I do mention in the book um some of the um dialogues and debates and disputes between the Deshi and Tharu groups particularly after 2007-2008 um and I talk about the formation history of uh, Naya Moloch um you know post 1857 it's kind of comparatively lesser time as part of the um Nepali state um, but there's not, again, there's not space to go into um, full disputes over kind of the relative prosperity or um, access to government or agency between individual Mideshi um, movements. There's, there's simply not the space in the book. But uh, thank, you for, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, yeah, I'm sure there'll be some great academic works on that. Yeah. Um, second one with um, yeah, the, the airport. Um, I, really quite shocked this is uh, going ahead. Uh, Nepal seems to be building all these international airports, which there seems to be little demand for. And of course, it's going to wipe out um, some of the last um, intact forests in the terrain. Um, I'm really quite concerned about it. Um, and you do have to wonder what, cons what consultation is being done with local communities, and is it being listened to um, at all? And I think we can all kind of guess, guess the answer um, to that. Uh, but I don't I'm not so positive about how much civil society can do to stop this kind of going ahead. I really would like to be positive and say this. I think for any factor you look at it, be it economically, it's certainly environmentally, um, this airport should not be, be going ahead, but it does seem the government is determined to, to press on with it. Um, so I'm quite unfortunately concerned about that. But who knows, we'll see. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there another uh, question? Oh, Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is a very simple one. What made you uh, study about Tarai particularly? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so I was in Kathmandu. Can we take more questions? Yo, oh, so, sorry. Yes, sorry. First, uh, if there are more questions. Uh... Okay. 
Oh, oh please. Okay, great. Uh, yep, so um, I was in Kamandu in 2015 and I saw you know, the uh, celebrations firsthand of the uh, constitutional promulgation. Um, but then I saw news reports, uh, friends in the Torah were sending me you know, videos of um, pictures of all these protests. And it really struck me as this kind of existential issue. How could half of the country be celebrating while half of the country are burning draft copies of the constitution, protesting on the streets? And it really kind of got me, got me fascinated um, by that. And then sub subsequently to that, I was looking at a lot of the particularly international media coverage and realizing how historically, it was lacking in historical context. You know, these issues don't, place, don't take place in a vacuum. And yet a lot of the international, even domestic media coverage would give one or two sentences about these protests. And I, kind of, I wanted to know more. Um, and it, then you kind of compare it with a lot of, again, international coverage after the earthquake or whatever. It's talking about Nepal as a Himalayan nation. Just last week, the BBC did a, a, um, a news piece on heat waves in Asia. And Nepal was one of the countries featured, but they were focusing on a heat wave in Birganj. But it said, Nepal, a Himalayan nation. And they go and talk about Birganj. So you're thinking, well, this is, this is asinine. This is ridiculous. So really, that kind of the disconnects and the disc discombobulation between international perceptions. You know, I'm obviously British. I'm not Nepali. And when I started traveling and researching Nepal, you had this conception of a Himalayan mountain state, and yet since 2001 census, over 50% of the population lives in the Terai. So this kind of disconnect really got me interested. Um, so it started with 2050, I'd say August during the Tikka Four Massacre, and then the con constitutional uh, protests and border blockade. Um, and I tend to find it um, relatively underreported within the international media, and certainly less understood. If you talk to a lot of foreign journalists, they may know a lot about the Himalayas, but they'll know very little about the Terai and the kind of reasons as to why it was um, interested, interested me in that. And actually why I decided to write the book, I was initially preparing a PhD proposal on Medeshi political identity, um, but I found this is, you know, it's well covered in academia. A lot of all these issues and some of these questions we've asked today, a lot of the answers already exist in the academic literature, but I found it was really quite difficult to start to engage in some of these because the assumption of knowledge, the barrier of knowledge is quite high. So I kind of wanted to write a book that I would have wanted to read, you know, a decade ago. And I've, I've, I've tried to do that. Obviously, it's not perfect, no book is, but hopefully it still provides that um, introduction and the grounding and contextual overview to help people kind of engage in some of these academic themes um, and so on. Thank you. Uh, if there are more questions. Uh, no? Yes, please. <laughs> so, during your research, uh, did you find uh, the recruitment policy of the government in past, like uh, in 60s and 70s, was one of the cause of claims to be discontent? Yeah. Did you find? Yes. Uh, Have you mentioned? Uh, I mentioned it briefly in the book, oh. and I also compare it with kind of current uh, current government uh, recruitment statistics. They it's better, but it's still there's still a lot, a lot of um, some of this isn't just around Madeshis and Jews, some of this is around caste, but uh, some major government institutions, um, Madeshis, particularly to Ruse, are still relatively underrepresented. I think the most important avenues of these, particularly around extrajudicial uh, killings and human rights violations, relate to state security forces, where um, I. I'm not going to, I can't remember the statistics on my head, I caught them in the book. The representation of Medeshis and Tarus in the army, mm -hmm. the APF, is really staggeringly low. Whereas uh, Kasaya, Tetri, oh, it's, it's, it's far, far higher over representation. So I think these are still avenues um, of underrepresentation um, today. Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, I think uh, I have already had a lot of discussion with him, so there are no <laughs> more questions. Uh, but uh, Maximilian, thank you so much for coming and presenting your book and uh, also and for exciting good work. Uh, and uh, we look forward to more publications in, uh, okay. in uh, related to this. Uh, and, uh, and with this, uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, to this uh, the research seminar series, huh? uh, and also in a rainy season, I mean, and it's <laughs> difficult to come to uh, in this weather. But uh, I think the hall is packed, and this, this is uh, this is what shows the interest in the book. Uh, so thank you so much, and uh, and yes, a round of applause for the book. And, uh, <laughs>